So I'm grateful to be able to share some thoughts on the status of the uh, Canadian Armed Forces as we go, we're about halfway into the second year of implementing uh, Strong, Secure, Engaged. And this conference asks us, amongst other things, to consider the international frameworks under which we operate. Of course, we are grounded in a rules-based international order, but the phrasing of that term is, in some ways, misleading. What we deem to be a shared understanding of principles is not universally recognized, and there are many actors now, both state and non-state, who do not abide by the rules that we follow. Dans un tel contexte, il est difficile pour nous et nos alliés de prévenir ou atténuer les conflits et d'étendre une paix durable. The question for us, then, is how to respond as those rules are increasingly violated by emboldened actors who, do, who wish to shape the geopolitical sphere. And the rise of uh, hybrid threats and what we call gray zone conflict, that is, actions that don't actu actually pass that threshold of what we traditionally term as war, presents uh, new challenges to us. But that's the new reality, and that will be the new steady state as we go forward. These conflicts are compounded by a variety of factors. Just consider the impact of climate change and, the increasing, and increasing natural disasters, or economic insecurity and the youth bulge in West Africa, or political corruption in failing states. Contemporary conflicts are rooted in multiple complex causes, and therefore they must have multifaceted and comprehensive solutions. And the military is but one part of that solution set, alongside our partners working in the diplomatic, information, and economic realms. As our global environment shifts and evolves, we are adapting, we need to adapt, and we are working hard to anticipate the upcoming challenges so that we can position ourselves in the Canadian Armed Forces for success in future warfare. So this morning, I will give you an update on where we stand with our current military operations, just sort of a brief overview. And then I'll speak about how the Canadian Armed Forces are being shaped to enter the mid-century as a robust, capable, and agile force. And then, of course, time for questions if, at the end if we do have time. So looking at operations, broadly speaking, we are engaged in operations in six theaters. Canada, the Arctic, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and the Asia Pacific. The Arctic for us is a distinct operational theater because of its distance and its unique challenges. And I think in many ways it was easier to force project into Afghanistan when we were serving there than it was into our own, uh, in, into our own backyard, the Canadian Arctic. Our domestic operations are shaped in many ways by our strong relationships. We work alongside many government departments and agencies at every level, federal, provincial, territorial and municipal, to help Canadians and to keep them safe. Take search and rescue, for example. Last year, our search and rescue teams conducted 866 missions, but that only represents a portion of the total search and rescue tasks that were conducted here in Canada. And that's because search and rescue is a shared responsibility. Our members are proud to work side by side with the Canadian Coast Guard to intervene when an incident occurs on water. And that includes Canada's major lakes, inland waterways, and our three coastlines. Together, the Canadian Armed Forces and the Coast Guard coordinate the response to more than 10,000 incidents every year. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, local police, and first responders lead efforts on the ground. And across Canada, there are hundreds of volunteer associations, regular Canadians, who are ready to answer the call and help. Whenever the Canadian Armed Forces helps the Canadian population, we do it in a cooperative and in a supporting fashion. Every winter, Canadian Army gunners from the reserve and regular forces work with Parks Canada to create controlled avalanches and to keep the Trans-Canada Highway open through Rogers Pass. And many, many years ago, I was a gunner, I was actually doing that. Um, so before this operation, avalanches were a deadly and destructive threat in that area. Pairing snow science and military precision, we ensure that the pass is safe and that this vital commercial and transportation link remains open 24 and 7. Nous sommes aussi une force de donner recours, toujours prête à aider lors des désastres naturels quand les premiers répondants sont débordés. We assisted provincial partners in their responses to six natural disasters in 2018, including floods, forest fires, and winter storms. 
And over the, over the past few years, our role in domestic disaster response has increased significantly. Climate change has resulted in more extreme weather, which has in turn produced more severe storms and natural disasters. We track these storms, floods, and fires very carefully to ensure that we are ready to help Canadians whenever we are called upon. And our reserve units play a particularly important role in this regard, and they have responded rapidly in their local communities on many occasions. This summer, we will put in place an immediate response unit made up entirely of reserve force members, which will be able to answer the call at any time. And this is but one example of how we are operationalizing the reserves and achieving full-time capability from part-time service. Looking to the north, the Arctic is a challenging theater of operations for a few interconnected reasons. Climate change has made the Arctic more accessible and it is being increasingly used for transit. The region also holds vast natural resources which give it great strategic value for Canada and for a number of international actors. The increase in traffic will undoubtedly increase the risk of incidents, so we continue to examine the evolution of our posture in that area. And as many of you know, the Canadian Rangers are our eyes and ears in the north. Their presence in communities across the north is instrumental in the conduct of Arctic sovereignty operations as well as search and rescue activities. And there's not a single day that goes by where we don't have rangers involved in remote areas, not just the Arctic, uh, in the coastal regions as well, involved in search and rescue. We also continue to work collaboratively with our allies to protect our territorial integrity. And a recent example of such collaboration occurred last month, and the Commander Norad talked about that, when US and Canadian fighter jets were scrambled to escort two Russian bombers that enter the Canadian Air Defence Identification Zone on January 26th. This was not the first time that foreign aircraft approached our coastline without permission, and nor will it be the last. These incidents reinforce the value of our NORAD partnership, as did General O'Shaughnessy's, O'Shaughnessy's presence here yesterday and his associated visit here in Ottawa. Last year, we celebrated the 60th anniversary of this strong binational partnership, and we will work with our American allies to modernize the North American Aerospace Defense Command so that we can continue to meet our airspace challenges of the future. Further south, in the Caribbean and the Eastern Pacific Ocean, our sailors and aviators operated with the U.S. Coast Guard to seize or disrupt approximately 17,000 kilograms of illicit narcotics last year. No patrouille qu'elles soient en mer ou dans les airs ont permis de perturber les trafics de drogue et d'en empêcher l'entrée en Amérique du Nord. Meanwhile, in Europe, our largest effort is our contribution to NATO assurance and de deterrence measures. As most of you know, Canada is leading a NATO-enhanced forward presence battle group in Latvia. Montenegro just joined the battle group in December, which brings the total number of contributing nations up to nine. That's nine NATO allies committed to working alongside the Latvian forces to increase the security and stability in the region, and is by far the most multinational of the, uh, of the battalions in the Baltics, the NATO battalions. There are 1,300 soldiers with 10 different native languages all working together for a unified purpose. And I can't think of a better example of tactical interoperability in the entire history of NATO. It's quite, uh, quite significant. Up and beyond the battle group, Her Majesty's Canadian ship Toronto is sailing with standing NATO Maritime Group 2 in the Merit Mediterranean Sea. And our CF-18 Hornets recently completed their NATO enhanced air policing in Romania. In Ukraine, we've trained and mentored more than 10,000 members of the security forces of Ukraine. And I'm proud of the way that this mission has evolved since 2015 and the contributions that our soldiers are making on a day-to-day -day basis. What started as a training mission primarily in two locations has developed into mentoring in almost 10 locations, 8 to 10 locations across western and central Ukraine. The number of Canadian troops that we deploy each year has not changed. But as we adapted our focus to mentorship and training the trainers, we've seen Ukraine's progress, progress as it builds its military capability and capacity. Outside of Europe, we are supporting NATO efforts in Iraq, where Major General Danny Fortana leads the NATO training mission. This group consists of approximately 580 NATO personnel 
of which uh, 250 or so are Canadian military members. The mission is providing training to Iraqi security forces to help build a more effective national security structure. In West Africa, our men and women deployed on Operation Presence have conducted seven medical evacuations since August of 2018. And their work is simple, but it's absolutely vital. And that's saving the lives of MINUSMA and partner forces in Mali. Our contribution to MINUSMA will be complete this July, and the Romanian Armed Forces will take over the responsibility for forward aeromedical evacuation. Finally, 2018 saw a substantial increase in engagement in the Asia-Pacific region. From Lieutenant General Wayne Eyre being named Deputy Commander of the United Nations Force in Korea, to our participation in multinational efforts to enforce UN sanctions against North Korea's maritime smuggling, in particular its use of ship-to-ship -ship transfers of refined petroleum products, to transporting over 120 kilograms of humanitarian supplies to Indonesia in the aftermath of the devastating earthquakes and the subsequent tidal wave, to multiple maritime deployments under Operation Projection, during which time we reinforced our bonds with Pacific partners, we have demonstrated our commitment to stability and security in the Asia-Pacific region, and we supported Canada's diplomatic efforts there as well. So that's a brief snap snapshot of the major operations, uh, recognizing that there's a lot more that the Canadian Armed Forces are doing right now. As of this week, there is slightly over 2,400 people. I can't give you the exact number. It fluctuates day to day. Uh, from the Canadian Armed Forces deployed on 21 operations around the world. Conducting operations is what we're designed to do. Uh, it's obviously our raison d'etre. But to be effective and to truly excel, we have some institutional priorities that we must get right. And first and foremost amongst those is Operation Honor. A lot has been discussed, a lot has been said about Operation Honor. You're all familiar, I think, with the reach in the Auditor General's report, but I think it's important that I talk a little bit about it today. The foundation of our ethos and culture is respect and the ability to work together. And our strength as a whole is derived from the individual sailors, soldiers, and aviators who have committed themselves to serving Canada. Tous les membres de notre équipe de la défense, sans exception, contribuent au succès de notre institution. Teamwork and trust are absolutely essential to the armed forces. So it is intolerable and unacceptable that some of our members have been attacked from within our own ranks. We are committed to eradicating sexual misconduct in all its forms from our institution and to taking care of and supporting the people who have been affected by it. Strengthening the armed forces starts with respect and invoking a cultural evolution that ensures a safer, more respectful and professional environment that allows all of our people to reach their maximum potential uh, is absolutely essential. General Vance has entrusted me and my team to push forward on these efforts, and I take this responsible, responsibility very seriously. We're almost four years into the operation, and we've learned quite a bit over that time. We initially started tackling the problem head-on and started with an orders-driven, top-down approach, which in a military organization I think is a logical and immediate response. But along the way, we've learned that we've inadvertently caused harm to some of our members. We didn't fully understand the ramifications of the duty to report on individuals affected by sexual assault. And you'll notice that I'm not even necessarily seeing victims because many people who have experienced sexual misconduct do not consider themselves victims. In some cases, it forced those individuals to report when they were not ready to or did not want to and that's something that we need, uh, we need to look at more closely. Our main effort is to do better to care for and support people who have been affected by sexual misconduct. We made some significant advances, but it is clear that we need to do more. So we're expanding the mandate and the resources of the Sexual Misconduct Response Center, further strengthening the independence as a body external to the Canadian Armed Forces. We're creating a comprehensive plan to determine how we can change beliefs and attitudes and creating lasting cultural change. And many of you have been involved in cultural change. It does not happen overnight. There are no quick fixes. 
Sexual misconduct is per pervasive across society. It is not unique to the Canadian Armed Forces, and it will take a lot of time and a lot of work to affect this cultural change, uh, but we're going to meet this head on. We will soon release a manual to help guide people through every aspect of this operation, whether they're an affected person, a bystander, a commanding officer, or anyone else. And we've implemented training programs such as bystander intervention training and the, and the respect in the Canadian Armed Forces program. Throughout all of our efforts, we're taking the recommendations from Madame Deschamps and the Officer of the Auditor General very seriously. We're seeking external advice and feedback to ensure that we capture a variety of perspectives on these issues. The operation must succeed and it will succeed and we will not relent. There's simply no place for sexual misconduct in our ranks and we will continue to fight it as we move forward. In a similar vein, part of the process of maintaining trust in the Canadian Armed Forces and indeed uh, with the Canadian public will be in how we respond to incidents of extremist behavior, racism, and other forms of prejudice and harassment. General Vance has said it before, and I'll say it again, good militaries are not racist. Discrimination undermines cohesion. Those actions erode the public's faith that the military is a force for good, a force that can be depended upon to be part of the solution. And fortunately, these incidents have been uh, very sparse. Acts of hatred have been committed by a few of our members in different locations across the country, but I can assure you that we are remaining vigilant and that we are responding. Across the Canadian Armed Forces, when leaders have been made aware of these incidents of racism and extremism in our ranks, we have responded promptly. That kind of behavior, prejudicial, derogatory, and belittling, is completely against our, against our ethics and our code of conduct, and it goes against everything that we stand for and everything that we fight for. Il faut régler ces questions pour éviter qu'elles nuisent à notre capacité de recruter et de retenir nos effectifs et pour assurer uh, la réussite des forces armées canadiennes dans le futur. So, where are we going to posture ourselves to fight in the future? This question occupies the chief and it occupies me. How can we best position the Canadian Armed Forces for warfare in the mid-century? What will future conflict look like? And by extension, what will the Canadian Armed Forces look like? So we've seen a taste of this, and we see indicators in current conflict. Cyber, space, and the cognitive domain are some of our new battle spaces. Our defense policy addresses this, and it calls upon us to increase our footprint and our capacity in these areas. And we are. For instance, last year, we created the cyber operator occupation. We're building our expertise in cyber operations, and we must carry on our momentum and remain relevant and proficient as the field evolves. This realm is a priority for many of us here today. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, CSIS, and the Communications Security Establishment immediately come to, to mind. We're all keenly aware of the impact that a cyber attack could have on our organizations, and on, on Canadian society a writ large. It's an ever-growing threat and one that needs close attention. History has shown that the evolution of warfare is constant. The warfare of the type experienced during the First and Second World Wars is long gone. That was a time when clear-cut moments of victory and well-defined opposing forces characterized that nature of warfare, and we simply don't live in a world like that anymore. We live in a world of hybrid threats, a world where the battle over narrative and data and the application of non-munition force just below that threshold of actual warfare are all parts of our daily experience and it's happening now. So we need to adapt. We need to set the conditions for our armed forces to succeed in the future. And we are fortunate that our government has articulated very specific operational requirements that we need to meet that have been enunciated in Strong, Secure, Engaged. Those requirements provide us with the building blocks and the logic by which we can build the armed forces that will fight effectively into the mid-century. We can do other things, and I spoke earlier about humanitarian and disaster relief operations, but at our core, we must be able to recognize and counter our adversaries' sophisticated hybrid tactics 
and retain at all times the ability to fight when necessary in, in conventional conflict. General Vance has called the concurrency of operations the most important objective in our defense policy. And I think many of you are aware we've had previous policies where we've been asked to do a number of things, but not concurrently, not at the same time. It was sort of picking from a menu, uh, if you will. The government has clearly expressed that we must be able to do three large 500 to 1,500 person operations in three different theaters. And that's on top of our responsibility to defend Canada, meet our NORAD obligations, and conduct similar sustained and time-limited deployments. And then there are a few things that immediately jump out from those conclusions, from that logic, and from the policy. The first is that being a good ally will continue to be key to Canada's future. The conflicts of tomorrow will require us to continue to operate with allies, coalitions of the willing, or with the UN in several places simultaneously. Secondly, we must operationalize the reserve force in a way that has not been done in decades, many decades, I might add, so that we can deliver on the concurrency of operations model. We simply can't get there without assigning more capability and more capacity to the reserve force. And that's one of the reasons uh, we're increasing the reserve ceiling by 1,500 people. They are and will continue to be critical to our operational capability. And perhaps even more significantly, we are going to recruit and grow to that ceiling. And I'm very proud to tell you that the, Canadian, the number of reserves in the Canadian Armed Forces grew last year by 2,135. First time we've seen significant growth in over a decade. And finally, we must shed any bias that we have. We're taking a good hard look at ourselves, at the kinds of qualities that we value in our members, at the way that we train our people, and at the way we are structured and the way that we actually employ our forces. We've lived most of our lives, I, I certainly have in my professional career, where strength and physicality were highly valued and in fact considered essential for members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Don't get me wrong, these are still very, very important traits for a large part of the military and that will continue into the future. Combat arms, fighter pilots, boarding parties, they all need to be in peak physical condition but that doesn't necessarily have to apply to everyone. And you don't need to be 10 feet tall and bulletproof to be perhaps the most powerful person at times in today's battle space. In fact, you may not even be on the same continent. What you can do remotely behind a computer can have significant consequences for an enemy force which is fighting you far, far away or conducting hybrid operations against us even on Canadian soil. We can't be limited by bias, which may dictate uh, that we screen re recruits predominantly on the basis of physical prowess when candidates could masterfully conduct their part of warfare predominantly in the cognitive domain. We also need to see the value in the human resources that we have so that we don't lose the people who can help us succeed in incre increasingly changing warfare. And we need to be able to attract people from the broadest possible swath of Canadian society. Diversity in our ranks is critical to continued success. La diversité doit être considérée comme un facteur qui multiplie nos efforts. Not just because we should be a reflection of Canadian society, which we are obviously part of, but because we need to be seen as a diverse and inclusive organization in order to compete for that scarce talent in an increasingly competitive human resources environment. We must be able to tap into the creativity, critical thinking, and diverse ranges of thought, experience, and skill sets that exist in our society. And if we can't do that, we're simply not going to win in the future. In terms of our overall institution, we need to, we need to make the long overdue investment in more and better enablers, logistics, engineering, signals, medical, intelligence, and information-based trades, to name just a, just a few. And that old terminology of tooth and tail is so outdated, so outdated. What we used to call the tail, in many cases, is now the tooth, uh, the line blurs. Uh, we are not a balanced force in the Canadian Forces right now. We don't talk enough about those trades, and they are critical in enabling us to deploy, to understand the environment, and to sustain ourselves in theaters of operations. When we talk about investing in the future, people often think about the hardware, the ships, the aircraft, tanks, armored vehicles. And we have reached some important milestones on this score last year. 
starting with the construction of our third Arctic offshore patrol vessel and the launching of HMCS Harry DeWolf. The first operational deployment of the Cyclone helicopter, which I might add was extremely successful with the aircraft flying over 500 hours in a six month tour and the acquisition of a new fleet of medium capacity logistics trucks for the Canadian Army. But all of that high tech metal and machinery would be ineffective without the skilled Canadian Armed Forces members who have to support and sustain it, ensure that we prevail. People are at the heart and the driving force of our institution. They will determine uh, where we will see, succeed, and that's why people figured so prominently in the last defense policy. So, as we evaluate ourselves, we will know where we need to invest and put our efforts. We will know the fitness levels that will be required for specific jobs based on the bona fide operational tasks and then we'll know where we can take risks. Once we fully understand the requirements for what we need on the ground, in the air, at sea, in space, and back at home, to deliver what the government expects us to do, we'll be able to shape ourselves for the future. And there's a lot of good work in that regard, and I hope some of you will ask questions about it. In conclusion, we all know that the nature of warfare is changing, and that it is changing fast. We're constantly analyzing trends to anticipate where we're going so that we can adapt to the rapid pace of transformation. That applies to the kinds of adversaries, adversaries that we might encounter, as well as to the allies and the partners who will be on our flanks. We have to adapt with them or we will become obsolete and irrelevant. We're on the right track and we're continuing to strengthen our relationships around the world through operations, international engagements, and military to military engagements. Together with NATO, the UN, NORAD, the Global Coalition Against Daesh, the multinational force and observers, and our domestic partners, we're rising to the challenges of the contemporary world. And once again, those challenges can't be solved only militarily. Which is why I'm so pleased to see colleagues from other government departments uh, who were here yesterday and today. We simply cannot afford to lose sight of the importance of diplomacy and comprehensive solutions to complex problems. We've worked side by side with government partners during significant events such as the G7 summit in Charlevoix last year, and I am confident that we'll continue to work closely and cohesively with whole of government partners in the future. Underpinning all of these efforts, of course, are the men and women in uniform and the families who support them. So I'd like to end my remarks today, my formal remarks, by saying how proud I am of our armed forces and the work that they do day in and day out. Their professionalism is respected around the world, and each day that I put on my uniform, I feel honored to be associated with such an extraordinary team. Mesdames et Messieurs, thank you. I look forward to uh, fielding some of your questions.